Okay, uh, I want to introduce uh, the panelists quickly. Um, on, on, on the other end is Aparna Ramani. She is the head of AI infrastructure, data infrastructure, and developer infrastructure at Meta, which means she's responsible for a lot of GPUs. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, right after her is Tree. Tree is a legend uh, in the deep learning community with his work on flash attention. Uh, he is also a, uh, a, a newly minted slash incoming uh, assistant professor at uh, Princeton, uh, along with being the chief scientist at, uh, at Together. And uh, next is Lisa, uh, Lisa Dunlop. She is at UC Berkeley working on Elimsys uh, Arena. Uh, along with uh, Anastasios, uh, also at Berkeley working on uh, LMSIS uh, uh, Arena. Uh, and for those of uh, you who are living under a rock, LMSIS Arena is how all language models get judged these days. And uh, I, I have heard that uh, all the tech CEOs every morning, they first <laughs> check like their, their place in, in the leaderboard, and this is the leaderboard that matters. Uh, and last, uh, but definitely not the least, is James Bradbury, who's the head of compute at Anthropic. And Anthropic, uh, no one knows what they do other than what they, <laughs> <laughs> what they publish, uh, which is very little. <laughs> but I heard they're building. <laughs> All right, this is, this is a good vibe. So let's get going. Uh, I, I wanted to first kind of um, ask Anastasius and Lisa about LMSYS. Uh, Arena has really taken off. It's been really useful, like because of all the offline benchmarks were failing and people were kind of overfitting to them. And so um, it came in a timely manner. But uh, I want to understand a little bit, what are the main challenges you've encountered in getting LMSYS to this high signal LLM eval tool? Um, maybe start, start with Lisa? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's uh, kind of fun to know that a ton of tech CEOs are looking at our like dinky Gradio app. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the challenges we've faced, uh, so like this started off and still is an academic project of us just thinking like, well, it kind of doesn't make sense that we have all of these benchmarks that measure like factual correctness when many of the questions being asked for chatbots have no notion of correct, right? And these models are so good that oftentimes they will you know, output the correct answer and then you have to decide, well, which one is more correct or which one do I like better? Uh, which is sort of how the whole chatbot arena started. When it comes to the challenges we face, it's a you know, open crowdsourced platform. It doesn't require logins. People can input any prompt that they like and we get a ton of data, which is great because we're capturing a lot of the distribution of what people are asking chatbots and capturing a lot of the questions that aren't in existing benchmarks. But it means that we have a crap ton of data that is, uh, you know, a lot of people asking hi and hello and trying to figure out which users are providing high quality votes, which users are giving, you know, very useful questions, trying to ensure that the data that we're evaluating on is a good representation of what people are asking. So I would say that's the biggest trying to figure out all this data. Very cool. I think that's like segues into my follow up for uh, Anastasios on, I think my personal opinion, but some other people have also been saying that LMSYS, uh, the leaderboard, is getting a bit saturated as the language models are getting more and more intelligent. Um, I want to understand how you all plan to tackle the next magnitude of complexity and intelligence. Yeah. Okay, can everyone hear me? Is this working? Yeah, that's working. Nice. Um, yeah, so I, I have a slightly different perspective on saturation. 
not surprising. But let me, so for those of you that don't know, in Chatbot Arena, what we do is we take this binary preference data. So people come to our site, they ask a prompt, and then they vote for two anonymous models, right? They vote which one is better, model A, model B, and then the identity is revealed. So from that, we compile a big data set and use that to run statistical regressions. And the statistical re regressions assign a score that tells you how good a model is, depending on basically its probability of winning against other you know, models and adjusted for strength. Okay, it's just a logistic regression. Now, people have been saying that this is saturating for a long time. People have been saying that, oh, this benchmark can't distinguish the strength of models for like a year. Okay, it was 4 mini. Oh, 4 mini, you're cooked. 4 mini is at the top. Llama 370B. Llama 370, exactly. Llama's at the top, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, but, you know, the 01 model was released yesterday. But it's, just just to be clear, Llama is amazing. Llama's great. Llama's great <laughs> we love Llama. Great model. Publish okay. a whole blog. Neutral <laughs> platform. Great model. Uh, 01 released yesterday. It's killing the leaderboard. It's not a little bit better. It's a lot better. So what's happening here? You can't... So there's no maximum in Arena. It's a relative benchmark. We're comparing models based on their likelihoods of winning against other models. So, you know, it's all that to say, it's not exactly a problem with human preference as a methodology. But what may happen, and what we have to guard against, is that models may just become similar. Yeah. Models may just converge, right? Like, become a total commodity, and then they all do the same thing on 99% of questions. And, I mean, to be frank, we should know that, right? And the benchmark will tell yeah. us that. But then the next step is we need hard questions. Yeah. We have pipelines for extracting the hard questions. The real thing is we actually, we just need community. Yeah. We need the whole community to come to lmarina.ai, go there, try the models and vote. Give us your hard questions. If you think the benchmark's not good enough, give us your prompt. Because what'll happen is we'll put it in the benchmark. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll find it because we're working on, we already have and we're working further on extraction techniques yeah. for the hardest data, the data that shatters the models. That's, um, and that's a convincing answer for this sure. This is what we need. I, I think what, uh, what Anastasia is saying is everyone should stop using all LLM services and just start using their stuff. And not only will you get everything for free, but also you'll be helping the community. <laughs> community voting. <laughs> be clear, we are not saying this. <laughs> um, I, I maybe want to check on, on James here. So Claude obviously has a lot of proprietary EULs, or I mean, in general, industry labs do. And s providers like Scale have started proprietary EULs as a service, and I'm sure other uh, there's many other companies doing something like that. What would you think? Would a nonprofit entity be able to sustain the complexity of uh, LLM evaluation, or will like well-capitalized companies uh, be the ones who will thrive? Um, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm I'm excited about LMSYS and, and what they've been able to do. I think like um, they're kind of constantly in a race against like um, the, you could call it saturation, but just like the sort of being able to identify the difference between like, um, I don't know, formatting differences or length differences or style differences and the like, um, the like really underlyingly what you're looking for, which is hard to even define. Yeah. But I think like, you know, every time someone makes a like, a point that like, wait, like, this model is ahead of this model for this kind of insignificant reason. Like they put out an update where, well, we've 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 you know figured out a way to adjust for that. Um, and and I'm I'm also excited about like it feels like there's sort of a new, um, like a new round of 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 evals and benchmarks that people are, are starting to build where like um, there's some lead time in like compiling you know difficult and often expensive benchmarks and. Um, there's clearly the, the demand for it, um, and I, I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about the like humanity's last exam <laughs> that um, uh, Dan Hendricks and Scale are, are, are building. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Like models are getting really good, but but also like it's pretty obvious that even O1 is like far from human level in in like most things that people want to do with their models. So like. 
I don't know, if, 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 if O1 does, like, sweeps existing benchmarks, then existing benchmarks are, in, like, insufficient. Yeah. Make, makes sense. So, talking about well-capitalized companies uh, coming to Aparna. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, Mark Zuckerberg mentioned that Meta would have equivalent of 600,000 H100 GPUs by the end of 2024. This is pretty staggering scale for a single company. And based on various industry newsletters, like uh, semi-analysis and stuff, this trend is not just isolated to one company. Across the industry, hundreds of thousands of GPUs are being hoarded in some kind of a weird race. Like, but as you lead a bunch of the software and hardware work here, what are the significant challenges you're seeing at this unprecedented scale? Yeah, not taking bribes for GPU. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're precious. Um, so, I mean, we, have, we are shooting towards a pretty staggering number by the end of the year. And um, I mean, I'll say it's not just about um, large scale training for LLMs. We have <laughs> over a decade, we've been investing in recommendation systems, our newsfeed runs, um, on AI technologies, so does um, our ranking and recommendation for ads. So we have a variety of use cases. Um, I will say the, that all of the generative use cases have really pushed us on scale in, 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 in very significant ways. And there's a number of challenges that come with it. I mean, for one, um, scaling laws are continuing to hold. And so every generation of model is getting larger and larger. That requires more data, more compute. Um, just for reference, uh, Llama 3 was uh, trained on over 15 trillion tokens of data. And you, you just need a bunch of computers to process all of that data and then run various quality algorithms on top of it. So that's one category of where we're continuing to scale. Um, the second one is compute. I mean, you just need a ton of compute. Um, and, you know, you know, even before you get to compute, you, you need power, because you need to power, uh, you need power to be able to build these data centers and then power that compute. And I think that's becoming more and more constrained, especially on very, very short notice. So that's a huge challenge for just any company building foundation models, I think, to go get that kind of power. Uh, on the compute itself, uh, there's very few companies producing GPUs, as we all know. <laughs> Um, and, and so it's pretty costly uh, to, to, get, to get these GPUs. Um, and so we're looking at figuring, we're looking at diversifying our sources for compute. We're building our own chips as well. We, um, I don't know if people talked about it, but we, we have our first chip launched for our recommendation systems and we're working on um, other workloads as well. So that's a huge constraint we see. And then when you come to the software itself, um, I think training at larger scales has uh, a bunch of different issues. I'm sure James will attest to this as well. You have um, fault tolerance issues because we're still very much in synchronous training mode, uh, which is the predominant state of the art right now. So you have a bunch of fault tolerance issues that we're working through. Um, and then you see um, algorithmic enhancements that are coming in to maybe like make that more scalable. And then when you go into inference, I think that's a different level of scale, especially at a company like Facebook, you're talking about 4 billion users being able to access um, you know, meta AI or whatever it is we're building um, and be able to have a very responsive experience. And so there's a lot of optimizations we do on inference. Nice. Scale. Are there any of the challenges you want to crowdsource to the fantastic crowd here? You want to it throw them a challenge? <laughs> <laughs> distributed training across heterogeneous hardwares across um, metros, I think is a good one. So you're <laughs> saying laughing. like 5,000 AMG, AMD GPUs, yeah. 4,000 NVIDIA GPUs, That's some right. MTI chips, some AMD chips, all of them training together in the same That's land. right. You should be able to train with a, a vastly heterogeneous fleet across vast amounts of geos because it's you know, easier to find power compute. Uh, all of the above, so that's a good challenge. For Makes sense. Um, coming to more GPUs tree, you basically um, help the industry get more efficient uh, with flash attention, and that, that's true. Um, and I, 
I want to understand, uh, like from what I understand with together, you all do do training quite a bit, but primarily a lot of people use together for inference. Yeah. Um, what, is, what are the scale and challenges you see um, in general uh, as someone who's deeply moved the industry, but also in particular for inference as the models scale by a lot, like they're scaling at an order of magnitude every right. X yeah. months? Yeah, I think uh, at, to, together we're, we're focusing a lot of effort on, on, on inference, obviously you know, tons of demand there. Um, what's particularly exciting for the past year or so is uh, you know, just a lot of system and algorithmic optimization. Uh, but what's more, what's more exciting, I think, is this next year or so, where it's sort of is in the wild west. You know, with O1, people are going to figure out, oh, you know, test time compute is a good idea, right? Uh, what, what format will this take? Well, no one knows. It's tons of, uh, I don't know, chain of thought, tons of sampling. I don't know what it's going to look like. So that's particularly exciting in some sense because uh, it's an opportunity, right? People are going to come in, people are going to propose new methods to do, to do inference, and, and that is going to require lots of infrastructure, lots of algorithmic uh, advances, uh, and, and, and lots of compute. Um, a lot of the, the chips, like uh, uh, from you know, some, of the, some of the chip maker, they've been focusing on, on, on inference, and they're very interesting. Um, but uh, it's now it's a little bit more difficult for them because you know they don't they don't know what the the inference workload is going to look like, right? So far in the last year or so, inference has been um, relatively stable. You know, you sort of run the model, run the forward pass, sample a bunch of times. That's been relatively stable. That's why we see chips like Grok and Cerebras and Samanova doing quite well. Um, but the, for the next year or so, um, I think the challenge is going to be um, just so much. Inference time compute is going to require a lot of flexibility, um, and so um, I think chips that are more flexible will, will do really, really well. Um, organizations that have this kind of um, that can make algorithmic advances, especially in, in, in inference time compute, is going to do really well. And organizations like you know PyTorch, um, who are building like libraries that the, the community can use. You know, I love GPT Fast and torch tight and, 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 and so on. Um, I think that's, that's going to serve the need of people exploring uh, uh, kind of different paradigms of, of using these models, especially in, in infant's time. Makes sense. If you're not building a flexible chip, inference advances, model advances like O1 are going to make you obsolete, is what Tree says. <laughs> um, so, James, I want to try to, for the rest of the panel, but like start with James, I want to actually try to get to one of the growing concerns around energy consumption and carbon footprint. Like all these models are massive and they take lots of power. Um, all of that power, even if it's clean power, it's a zero sum kind of thing in terms of global power usage. How do we balance this? Like, how do we balance the need for larger models, like traded off against like energy footprint um, in general? How do you think about it? Um, I mean, like the yeah, AI scaling is definitely consuming a, a decent amount of power, both for training and inference. Um, I think like it's still a very very small fraction of like overall U.S. or global power, but where it's pushing up against um, some some sort of Scaling limits is basically that it's a, a, an increasingly large fraction of new power, right? It's like an increasingly large fraction of like net new demand for power in the U.S. is coming from AI, um, and like I think the like media attention on that has really um, spiked this year. Um, uh, just, just, uh, just a question: How, how, how many orders of magnitude are we off from like AI power versus all of U.S. power or something like that? Um, AI power in the U.S. is probably like single-digit gigawatts, and total U.S. power on on average is something like 400 gigawatts. I'm probably yeah. misremembering that. Um, so, okay. like, on the order of one percent. Got it. Um, but like much more than 1% of sort of net new power demand in this year and next year and the year after that. Um, 
I think the one, one thing that people that like I feel like the industry hasn't done enough of is understanding the extent to which certain AI workloads, not all AI workloads, but like large scale training and, and some, some workloads like that are, um, have the potential to be like better citizens in the power market than other workloads, than, than like more traditional data center workloads. Um, in that like, you know, if, if you can't train 100% of the time, that's maybe okay. Um, Got it. What's so, an example so you can, you can have of, demand response, things like that. What's an example of a workload that, that you say is well, well like, nicer? So, so like, traditionally data centers were like, uptime was the king and um, you had to have multiple sources of power coming into your data center from like multiple utilities and um, you had to like, uh, you know, have a giant generator for backup and get permits on that generator. Um, Got it. Okay, so you're saying that you can make it a bit more flexible. Yeah. Um, Aparna or Tree or Lisa, any of you wanna? Yeah, I think models are gonna get a lot more efficient. Okay. Um, I think it's, we're running up against this kind of economic wall where, okay, you're spending uh, billions of dollars, this talks of, I don't know, if you buy a, 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 a one million chips, that's, I don't know, 40 billion or 100, 100 billion dollars, right? Somehow you have to generate enough value to justify that, um, right? And people are finding some, some value of these things, you know, coding assistance and, and, and so on. But it's still not yet clear if, if um, all of this is gonna pay off. So what that means is I think there's gonna be this economic pressure of people deploying it, uh, these, these models, running up against, um, okay, uh, there's energy costs, there's, you know, um, you have gotta pay for all these GPUs, so how do you actually make money? And I think that, that economic force is gonna make models a lot more efficient. I mean, these models are, are probably an order of magnitude larger than they should be. So far, we've been okay with that because, you know, you keep, you keep scaling and it keeps working, so, you know, why stop? Um, but at some point, I think you're gonna run against this economic force that's gonna, gonna force all of us to, to be a lot more efficient with, with the models. I agree with that. I mean, both the economic force as well as just the physical constraints Makes of being able to find power, I think it's just gonna force a set of innovation, I think, that we absolutely yeah. need, so. Okay, from what I understood, 1% of usage, if you scale the models to orders of magnitude, <laughs> will not become 100% because we're gonna make the models more efficient in the process, and we wouldn't have the money as any individual company to try to do that kind of ridiculous stuff which is good news for all of us. <laughs> we can still use our ACs. All right. <laughs> Go, going back to, um, uh, coming back to the benchmarking side of things, I wanna like kinda touch a little bit on this whole offline versus online benchmark debate. Um, everyone, is very two-sided. Like, you know, I, I think I've heard two arguments in the community. One is, hey, like, enough offline benchmarks, enough, like, you know, we, if we do like a million different diverse offline benchmarks, that's sufficiently to measure progress. And others saying, no, like, anything less than A-B testing is falling short of how complex and beautiful humans are uh, and intelligent humans are. So, so ver like I wanna maybe hear from some of the panel, maybe starting with Anastasius. Yeah, um, I mean, I'll start with a, a tautology, which is that all benchmarks are good, <laughs> right? We're like after the truth. Everyone here is after the truth. And static benchmarks and live benchmarks like Arena, they both fill a role. Static benchmarks, I think about static benchmarks as like a test. Mm -hmm. They measure a specific kind of performance at a specific point in time. After that point in time, they start to, you start to worry about contamination and you know, so on and so forth, right? Yeah. Um, so, but they can be more fine-grained and more targeted and yep. measure a specific kind of performance in very close detail that you might not be able to measure otherwise. Now, um, live evils like Arena, we need evals that move as fast as the models, basically. Because right now what's happening is you get a new model every week, every month we're getting, you know, models and models and models and we need to be able to track them. Um, and the live email, uh, evals are kind of unparalleled for that because they're constantly getting fresh data. You're not suffering from statistical overfitting 
um, as, the, as the static benchmarks would. So they both serve their place. Makes sense. Um, Lisa, maybe to try to extend that a little bit, one of the things that I've heard is as the internet is being populated a lot with, um, with generated data, a lot of like NLP statistics and fundamentally like how we build benchmarks from internet uh, data, especially offline benchmarks, is like it's harder. Like you know, I think I saw Word Freak like froze their uh, frequency counts to 2021 because they're like we can't trust anything on the internet after that in terms of like how humans speak. So in, like in terms of like the challenges of offline benchmarks as more of the world is going to start speaking like delving and like all these <laughs> other things, how, how, like you know, how, how do you see the contamination being like a problem? That's a great question. I mean, contamination in general is hard because even putting aside the like generated data, uh, I used to work in robustness and I left that field because LLMs came to be and it's like, how do you know what's out of distribution? This model trained on presumably everything. I'm assuming it's trained on every single benchmark or offline benchmark that exists. Like, this is, this is quite hard to measure. And with generated data, it does bring sort of a, an additional question of are you putting sort of generated data in your benchmarks? I see offline benchmarks as like they should be high quality. Uh, and I, I think online benchmarks can sort of be a little less, uh, a little more like messy. Uh, so hopefully, I would hope that an offline benchmark, there was quite a lot of work in the data curation and hopefully a lot of human in the loop in the data curation. That's where I see offline benchmarks sort of having a, a one-up on online benchmarks. Of you're going for quality, you're going for specificity. Um, but yeah, I guess that's... Makes sense. All right, I want to ask one last question, which is for all the panelists, and this is going to be pretty open-ended how you all answer it. Clearly, we're in a race of sorts, like every company and academic lab, not really, but... Uh, you know, they're, they're in a race of resources to build something intelligent and big and maybe eventually capture some of that value. Um, where does this race end? How does this race end? Will this race not end in like super intelligence but end in like a winter? Like, like I want to understand, like this is very open-ended, like you know, you all can answer as controversially as you want or as like as neutrally as you want, but I'm just curious like where uh, the panelists' heads are on like how this all ends. Maybe starting with Aparna. Um, yeah, the optimist in me. I, I mean, look, we see models improving year after year dramatically. We're seeing step changes, right? Every model's kind of getting way better than the previous version. I think that pace is continuing so far. I think that if that pace keeps up, I think we will get closer and closer to some version of generalized intelligence uh, within, I think, the next decade is my prediction. It, the caveat is what she just said around, you know, it's way too expensive. The constraints are way too high. So along with the innovation on the modeling research side, I think there has to be a corresponding innovation on how we scale um, these models themselves and uh, all the infrastructure innovation and the two go hand in hand. But yeah, that's my, that's my generalized intelligence within the decade. Nice. Yeah, I would say it's sort of a, a new computing paradigm. I, you know, I'm not so AGI pill. I, I, but I think it's, it's going to be serve as a kind of infrastructure that people can build on, um, sort of like you know the internet, um, and there are tons of you know, company building on, on the internet. Uh, for example, Meta is one of them, right? Uh, so there's this new paradigm of, of, of AI. What can what can people build with that? And I would say right now is actually a great time to build because the bar is is very very low. Like you can prompt 
your way, uh, you know, with cloud and whatnot, to write a very you know, decent app and websites and, and, and so on. And that's, I, I think it just takes a little bit of this like, product sense or business sense uh, to build the right product because right now the infrastructure is, is actually quite good. The, the bar is very, very low. So I, I imagine the models will get better. People will find kind of the, uh, the, the, the more innovative use of, of these models. I think we're, like, we're at a very, very early stage of getting value out of these models. Yeah. Um, so I, I, would see, I, I would say tons of new applications, creative ways of, of using these models and all these you know, AI models will serve as infrastructure for the next computing paradigm. Sense? Lisa? Yeah, I, I think I agree a lot. Uh, I remember I was uh, asking my advisor, Trevor, like a year or two ago, like, oh, do you think these LLMs are going to be like the next big thing? Do you think they're going to change the game? And he said, uh, I mean, not not really. Like, it was, it's probably kind of like how the internet changed the game. I was like, I feel like the internet really changed the game. Like, I don't, I don't really know where that's coming from. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, this AGI, I don't even really know what AGI, uh, no one has given me a clear definition of AGI. Uh, but I think that, I see the future is, is a lot of finding new, uh, new avenues of where to apply this. I think everything is still very tech focused. Like, we even see this in Chatbot Arena, like, People, are, people who are thinking of how to apply LLMs are often people who are building LLMs or people in tech. And I really don't think there's been as much effort in tapping into LLMs for non-tech fields. And uh, the path seems very clear to me of how LLMs can advance you know, the future of coding, how to put all software engineers out of a job, but it is not clear to me how LLMs can, can be applied outside of the tech space, so. Yeah. James? Yeah, I, I, I think like the bulk of the industry still doesn't really take seriously um, the implications of, or like seriously enough, the implications of like AI systems being able to do the, um, you know, the bulk of economically valuable intellectual work. Um, and I don't think that, I think that there's a decent chance that there just really aren't any big obstacles on the way between here and, 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 and that kind of world. Um, that's like much, much bigger than the internet, much, much bigger than electricity. Um, and that, are you saying the race ends when that happens? No, or? no, the race does not end when that happens. That's like, that's just when, um, th when things start getting crazy, right? Like that's, that's when the, the paradigms and like the, the ways of, of thinking about like companies and economies and um, jobs like start to, to, to fall apart and, and we need sort of new paradigms and, 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 and like new institutions and, and um, we, we all just have to build it and it's gonna happen really fast. Scary. <laughs> <laughs> Anastasius? I only, so everyone, a lot of people on the panel know much more about scaling than I do, but I'll just mention one thing, which is that measurement is key to progress. Okay, and you know, I'm the eval guy, so Said I have like to say like a true elemsis person. Exactly, but that is to say, in order to continue to scale, it's going to be critical that we are effectively measuring our progress because people need something to climb. People need, a, people need the North Star to say, hey, we're getting better, we're getting better. And that's how ultimately the models are gonna be selected, they're gonna be built. We, to some extent, know how to scale, but do we know how to eval? I don't know. I think that's a very much an open question. Yeah. And you know, we need help on it. So reach out. <laughs>